Alec Gill is an author, filmmaker and photographer, academic and a social historian best known for his documentary of Hessel Road during its trawling days. Alec, welcome to the reading room. Uh, thank you, Karen. Now, you started documenting Hessel Road as a photographer first in the mid-70s. What was it that drew you to Hull's fishing community? Well, uh, well, I'm born and bred in Hull, but not the fishing community. I was born in the old town, and I love travelling. And, as a tra- and I, I had, um, I still got, a roller cord camera. And um, so uh, the thing about having a, a big twin-lens reflex camera like that um, is that it's like a passport into anybody's world, really. They sort of see it and it gets respect. Mm. It, it's like, better than a press card. Uh, and I've been to Northern Ireland as well. And when I was in Northern Ireland, this is 1971, the height of the bombing yeah. campaign, and around Derry uh, in particular, the soldiers said, oh, put that away, you know, I don't want you doing that. Uh, so I was restricted in, in what I could photograph there. Mm. But so I thought, I'm still going to photograph. So I was in the uh, Falls Road and round there, and like I said, the box I had before then. So I photographed the kids just playing on the bomb buildings. And that was good. I've I've, uh, exhibited some of them pictures. Now, so that was 1971 and Israel in 1973. Then 1974, I became a mature student at the University of Hull. And Professor Clark, uh, doing psychology, my supervisor was Professor Clark. And he was doing a lecture and he was comparing middle class children with working class children. And he said, um, middle class children have got gardens to play in, they've got access to this, that and the other. Whereas working class children have only got the freedom of the streets. Mm. And so I thought, oh, well, that's a good theme. Anyway, I began photographing the kids of Ezra Road. And so that's how it began in 1974. And I had this theme, you see, the freedom of the streets. And so, and coming, having played, coming from a working class background myself, um, and playing on bomb buildings around the old town, the whole was heavily bombed, as you know. As you know uh, so I had this affinity with them. And if anybody said, uh, oh, what are you doing, mister? I'd say, oh, I'm doing a documentary, photo documentary of Hessel Road. And so that's how it began. So you started off interview, you started off working, photographing just the kids on Hazel Road. At what point did you start to realise there was a wider story to be told about the whole community of Hazel Road? As soon as it was announced in the Daily Mail uh, that it was going to be demolished, that it was going to be this wholesale demolition. You see, there's certain people in the council, maybe the officers more than the councillors themselves, who want to get rid of Hull its image mm. as a fishing village, you know, northern fishing port and all that sort of thing. And, um, and I think part of this wholesale demolition was part of that policy, if you like, or whatever. And um, so I thought, oh, gosh, you know, this gave some urgency to it. And so my first exhibition, solo, I've, I've had 20-odd exhibitions, solo exhibitions. Um, my first one was 1979 and um, at the Gate Gallery in the Old Town. Uh, and that was the kids of Essel Road, like I say, and I had school, the, got the schools in the area to do paintings, colour paintings, to contrast with black and white pictures, you know. So uh, I extended it. The next exhibition was the elderly of Essel Road, so that became another theme. <clears throat> and then I was approached by the Royal National Mission to Deep Sea Fishermen. It was their centenary in 1981. Mm. Would I do some photographs for them, you know, for that ex- centenary exhibition? Mm. And that was at the, what's, uh, well, the Maritime Museum. Yeah. And so uh, that's how it evolved, you know. So you started working in Hesel Road or with the people of Hesel Road about yeah. 1974. So was the fishing industry already starting to get its death blows by then? I'm trying to work out the timeline, because around that time we're talking about the last Cod War. Correct. Which basically did for the whole fishing industry. Where does that fit in the timeline of you working in it Hesel does. Road? Well, it does. In a wider context, historically, uh, the Cod Wars have been going on Although officially there was three Cod Wars where the Navy was involved, there was four going back to the 1950s mm. uh, when the Icelanders made it four miles uh, from three miles. And, uh, well, they, it sound, doesn't sound much, but they took it headland to headland. Right. So they, and then, they, then it became 12 miles, 50 miles, 200 miles. And uh, so, yeah, the, I think the final one was, I have to check this, but 1976. Mm. So, but yes, the... The right, so really, Hessel Roaders, the fishing families of Hull, they had a double whammy. On one hand, they're losing the Cod Wars, 
and the ships, the trawlers, the old sidewinders, were getting scrapped at Draper's Yard, uh, further near Victoria Dock. And then the bulldozers were moving in to get rid of these streets. And by this time, you're about to start writing your first book. I took a year off yeah. uh, to concentrate on Isle Road photography. And then I thought, oh, well, uh, I'll try and do postgraduate research. And that took me to Cardiff. Right. Uh, so in 1979, um, I ended up in Cardiff doing postgraduate research. But my heart was still in Hesel Road, really. Yeah. I shouldn't have gone. But the thing was, I, I, while I was in Cardiff, I was having exhibitions back in Hull. I had two exhibitions in the United States. I had an exhibition at the University of Hull that yeah. came along, uh, thanks to um, Hull Truck. They'd mount, mounted an exhibition there. And the guy at Hull Truck, uh, sorry, at the University of Hull, who mounted the expi- exhibition, um, it was Gary Sargent, and he was the graphic artist there within the university. And so he uh, got chatting to him, and it transpired as an artist. He, he was a graphic artist and other, other, other forms of art. Um, he'd done a load of sketches of Hesler Road. His friend, um, Alan Bauer, uh, he, he edited the book. And so he took me under his wing, the head of English, and your skills about writing, which I benefited from. And so that's how I got into the writing world. Right. And uh, so to me, was like, um, well, a mentor mm. was Alan. Shall I give you an example? Yes. Um, he said, when you're writing about, say, the fisherman's uniform, the, the suits, and all the rest of it, well, it's a light-hearted uh, thing. Um, you can lay it on with the trowel. You can elaborate and describe their, their dress, the Spanish waistbands and the half-moon pockets, and you can partly go overboard. However, if you're talking about the loss of a trawler, whereby, you know, lives have been lost, you do not overdo it. You know, you just keep your sentences simple, short and simple. You know, a trawler goes down, you know, you say a trawler goes down, you don't try yeah. and add too many adjectives and all the rest of it. And so he, he just gave me lots of tips and about that sort of thing. So I was lucky there. Yeah. Anyway, then, but between you and me, <laughs> I wasn't happy with the publicity or lack of publicity that I got from Hull University Press. It didn't sell that well. So I thought to myself, oh, I want a better... Uh, yeah. And I want an opportunity to print my photographs as well. And um, so I asked my friend, a historian, Chris Ketchell, um, who, would, who should I go with? And uh, he recommended Hutton Press as being the best option for local publishers. And so I got to know Charles Brooke, put it to him. And so my second book <clears throat> is this one, um, Hesel Road, A Photographer's View yeah. of Holt. And what I learned, actually, about village from village within city, you learn by mistakes, hopefully, is that the title was too clever. Village within a city could be anywhere. Anyway, so I thought, you know, learn by mistakes. Um, I thought, well... Um, I'll be more direct. If yeah. it's about Hesler Road, call it Hesler Road. And so it's Hesler Road, and I love subtitles. Mm. Uh, so this one is um, a photographer's view of Hull's trolling days. And so it was that, you know, it was yeah. words and pictures yeah. of mine. So the first one was 1985. Yeah. This one, uh, the Hesler Road, is 1987. And so we're into the 1980s now, obviously. And then the next one was one very close to my heart. And it's called uh, Lost Trolls of Hull. But then... Um, ah, superstitions. Yeah. And I still think that uh, anybody that wants to teach in West Hull, for example, it should be required for anybody that's, that's on uh, teacher training. Because if they want to understand the children that they're working with, they need to understand the traditions that they come from. Right. Oh, well, that's thank you for kind of you to say so. Yeah. I wasn't brought up superstitious. And um, so people would mention superstitions and being, you know, your academic background, etc., etc. You tended to be a bit sceptical. And I thought, oh, yes, all very well and good. And uh, I didn't bother. But then sometimes when Ezra Rudd was telling you a story, the superstition was so entwined and meshed within it, you couldn't not put it down. So, being a, like having listed all these lost trolls of Hull, I began to list superstitions. So, so I, I thought, well, why do they survive? I mean, if you go back to Cicero and the Greeks, uh, people have been predicting the death of superstition, how education and knowledge is going to wickle it, you know, make them extinct. Uh, but they're, they're wrong. And I, and I believe that... Super, so, as a psychologist, I was able to link in superstition with the primitive part of the brain 
and uh, how it's basic to our human survival. So the trawlermen and the families, because they are confronting nature, uh, this is why I think it brings superstition to the fore. Mm. And uh, so I call this chapter, uh, part five, uh, Fear of the Gods. And, um, and I bring in, you know, gambling and the, uh, partly the occult and uh, pagan parallels. Because I go back to our cave dwelling times mm. and um, how they were, yeah. in, you know, close to survival, yeah. life and death. Yeah. There are a couple of traditions and superstitions that seem to go beyond just superstition. This thing about how common it was for sailors, or for fishermen rather, and to some degree sailors, a maritime tradition or superstition, of not actually bothering learning to swim. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I wonder what that says about, or what it says about the people from Hesel Road or what it kind of feeds back in to the psyche of the people of Hesel Road, that they can be so fatalistic as to bend the majority of their working life at sea, yeah. but at the same time not learn to swim. It, it's contradiction and superstition go together. But no, not swimming. You, like you're implying or saying directly, um, if your profession is to be at sea, you yeah. think it'd be yeah. compulsory. Um, <clears throat> and, I, well, when I, and on my, one of my DVDs, How to Troll and Last of the Hunters, I put this to them. Uh, for, you know, some patrolmen, and I say, well, why didn't you learn, to, you know, to swim? And um, the <clears throat> and they say, oh, well, why prolong the agony? You know, and they, they, they come up with that one. And then I say, oh, well, what if it was summer? You know, you were just steaming past Scarborough, yeah. and and it's the middle of August, and um, you know, you can just swim to, to uh, ah, you know, I tried to corner them, you know, it's a bit like a chess game, um, and uh, they say, ah, well. Um, if you did that, if you were saved, then the sea will simply claim somebody else. Well, there, like you said as well, um, is the fatalism coming in. And the fatalism is the simplest philosophy in the human race, really. I mean, if you're fatalistically, sorry, if you're fatalistic, um, then the, you know, you just accept things. And if you're on a ship going down, it's better to be accepting fatalistically uh, accept your death, then to be panicking. Because mm. panicking and getting excited very rarely yeah. helps any situation. From, from your books and from the DVDs, you do get a kind of sense that they are challenged by nature in a way that almost no other profession is. How much farmers go on about you know, how difficult it is to make a living off the land? It's not like the land is almost going out to kill them. No. And they're trying to... It's not a it's not a day-to-day -day battle for survival. And I wonder if that day-to-day -day battle for survival and the fact that death was so close and hanging over every man when they went out to sea meant that it seemed like there was almost no point in fighting it in a logical way. They had to find other ways to fight it. There was... I don't know if it was your book, there was somebody that I know... I read once about the idea of superstitions, which was that you've got so much to gain if it works <laughs> and so little to lose yeah. if it doesn't. The sacrifice that you make to fulfil these superstitions on the whole is much smaller than, than what you have to gain. No, I didn't say that. It was a good one, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd say sometimes is that superstitions is like a double-edged sword. Uh, on one hand, you're trying to avert bad luck, and at the same time, you're trying to draw good luck, do you? And in a way, superstitions can't lose. You can have hundreds of Friday the 13th, and nothing happens. Yeah. You know, there's no, no disasters or anything. But all it takes is one, and then, oh, yeah, you know, just reinforces uh, the old traditions, you know. And Apollo 13. But my mother watching television, and um, she said, oh, I know why. I said, oh, yeah, why, why, you know? <laughs> <laughs> because it's number 13. 13 yes. totally. And there you are, you are the scientist trying to defy superstition, you know. One group that is really superstitious is astronauts. And yet yeah. they get there and back <laughs> completely by the endeavours of science. Yeah, yeah. And yet they have <coughs> rituals Correct. that they follow all the way from the moment that they set off on their journey to wherever it is and yeah. until they get back again. Which brings me to another one of the... I wouldn't say it's a necessarily a superstition, but it's a heavily ingrained tradition, which is uh, of spending the settlement money. Oh, yeah. The, the, 
a phrase that I just think is so beautiful, which is three-day millionaire. The idea that you, you basically blow all your settlement money, which is what you got on top of the wages. Yeah. This is the thing that I didn't realise until I started reading through your books, is that the women in Hazel Road, whose men were working, would take home... The basic... A, a basic work, work, yeah. a, which was, you know, a man's working wage. And then for three days every three weeks, out of every three yeah. weeks, the men would come back with hopefully a pocket full of money. Yeah. Spending beyond spending like a sailor. Is, does that link into the fatalism again of the life, you know, the lifestyle that they lead linking into uh, the way that they earn their money? Yeah, very much so. And, uh, and it's living for the moment, you know, this living. Uh, but it, it, no, there, there is a section on money and uh, it's very much linked with superstition. And um, the, 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 the superstition was, if you went back to sea with money in your pocket, then the sea, or King Neptune, or whatever the forces, uh, would see that you were adding money, you had enough, and so you wouldn't get a good catch. And so there's a punishment element there. But no, the money scramble is, is, a, ma ma is a good one, because going back to sea on the third day of being a three-day millionaire, um, if they had any loose change, they'd throw it to the kids in the street. So the kids would hang around, you know, outside the pubs sometimes, uh, hoping for a money scramble. And then there's another expression, a bit morbid, oh, there's no pockets in a shroud. You know, meaning you can't take, well, you can't take it with you. Yeah. yeah. And which is true, really. You come in to the world with nothing and you go out yeah. the same way. It, you know, although we've, we've spoken about how there's much to gain and little to lose by yeah. following superstitions, if you think about by 1978 when the fishermen had been thrown out of their jobs. The idea that they'd thrown away <laughs> money for the previous 100 years or whatever suddenly seems to be a little bit more harmful. Yeah. Uh, your video work, which is one of the things that... Reading your books was fascinating. Watching the videos and talk, where you talk to people about Hazel Road, along with some of your photographs and other people's photographs, really brought what Hazel Road must have been like a lie for me. One of the things that kind of struck me that never struck me before was because the tide dictated the, the way, uh, the, the rhythms of life of Hesel Road. And, you know, you'd be, you'd be getting, the tide would come in at midnight, so you'd get the ships coming in, in at midnight. This idea of a 24-hour city, yeah. it seems like Hesel Road <laughs> was a 24-hour city before anyone even thought of the idea yeah. in this country of opening up 24 hours. Yeah. And I was right. walking down Hesel Road... Again, to, I, I worked down Hesel Road, or near Hesel Road, and I thought I'd take a walk down there. And it, it doesn't, you know, that, vi you, that vibrancy doesn't seem to be there anymore. Oh, but no. you can feel that idea that it could be 11 o'clock at night and there's a buzz going on because yeah, yeah, the tide's right. coming in right. and the trawler's going to be coming in and the families are all getting ready. Uh, and I kind of wonder, they didn't mention it in the, in, uh, the DVD, whether the pubs actually had lots of lockings and, and whether it really was like a kind of party town, depending on I think what would, was going on. Uh, I mean, you had your laws then, and the yes. pubs closed at three, and then they opened the open liquor window, Dabs Timbers, that's me. Yes. Um, yes. But then the men would have belong clubs. Yes. And so, say, Rainers or Criterion or whatever, uh, halfway kicked out at the legal time. I mean, I think you would have your lock ins and all that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you would all have membership to D Street Club or yes. St Andrews Club, and then they'd go there and extend it. But then they were closed down as well um, and so that I could take a lot of beer bottles and um, and uh, go back to somebody's yeah. house yeah know. there was a bit in the video where they had some sort of uh, I'm not even sure it was like I'm not even sure if they just made up their own law that everyone yeah. had agreed to which was you could go and get the bottles from the beer off yeah and as long as you didn't pay for them oh yeah yeah and I've, I've got a feeling that if you actually look back at that that's there's, right. there's no legal basis for that but everyone decided <laughs> that that's what the law was even the police was, yeah even the police even the police decided that's the way that it was that was work. boiled oil shop yeah yes. there, there was the three daughters and the mother that's right yeah talking about yeah. that yeah and one of the things that the photographs don't really bring to life or aren't capable of bringing to life so much is the fashions. Yeah, well, it's it was a unique style. They called it the fisherman's uniform. Eh? Um, and you had what some... I mean, they, they varied, you know, the colours. And there was as if there was... They had this flamboyant lifestyle. I mean, at sea, 
you you not don't shave, you don't get washed, you know, and you're dealing with smelly fish, and you, it's it's a terrible job. And so when you come ashore, you sort of go to the other extreme, and the suits reflected that. And the um, uh, so you had you one of the colours was Decilena blue. It's very pale blue was a good one. And on the DVD, one bloke. Um, Smith, I think you call him. He, he he talks about one called uh, soup that was pink. Yeah, you know, and uh, um, and the tailor talked about the different the the, the bell bottoms, and um, and the half moon pockets and all that shit. And I can remember, well, it was Keith Gale put me onto this. He's a singer songwriter. Uh, he sings the song "Settling Days" yeah. on my Arctic Trauma one, but he put me onto this. Why is it that they dress like the way they do? And uh, for the for people who don't know, you know, listeners and viewers, um, I, I used to think, well, the bell bottoms have obviously got that because the trauma were enlisted into two world wars. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is centenary is that going on for the yeah. first world war now, and um, so there would be in royal in royal navy uniform, and there we know the sailors swaggering along with their bell bottoms. The thing as road lads, troll lads were into, was f- country and western this strong influence um, of the country and western. And he said they, they would go and to the pictures, they'd watch Hollywood cowboys and Indians, John Wayne and all this uh, high noon and all the rest of it. That's what appealed to them. When they were at sea, they would read western paperbacks. They'd get a dozen of them or more and um, go and read them there and then um, change them when they came back or whatever. And they would, um, and so it reflected in their uh, outfit, the half moon pockets, Spanish waistband, and the trousers, nothing to do with the sailors, uh, no Royal Navy, he said, is from the cowboy chaps, oh, right. the rawhide cowboys. Yeah. And um, in fact, I saw an old film, I think, watching it and um, Gary Cooper I think it was and they had these raw hard chaps on you know the big so they're imitating so they are you know having played and also on the DVD uh, Stan Cox who was a cook on the trawlers he drew the analogy uh, and so did Keith Gay before that your cowboy is uh, sorry your, your trawler lad is can, can relate to the cowboy uh, because they're out there on the prairie are uh, the cowboys alone so out there with nature and they're driving the cattle, uh, and they're on horseback, and they're singing the songs. <coughs> and the trawler man up in the Arctic can relate to that, mm. you know, trying to herd in the fish, uh, the lonesomeness, the barrenness, the, the, the risk, of, uh, risk of loss of life, you know, in battling against nature. So the pa- and under the stars and all the rest of it. So the parallels are very, very strong, the affinity. And so this Hollywood, I have a chapter in this book uh, at, at the old fishing heritage um, called, um, called Arctic Cowboys. And I, I draw this strong link between, uh, and I think this could be exploited quite a lot in Hull's 2017 mm. uh, City of Culture yep. thing, you know, something. So, and then the thing that Keith Gay, going back to him, clinched it with, he said, well, Alec, it says, um, what is the song that they sing at the boulevard? You know, Hull FC is black and white. What is their song of the early birds? It's old Faithful. And it's Old Faithful. faithful yeah. Couldn't get more country no. and western than that. On the terraces, threatening stand, etc., and uh, also the new stadium. Um, they're singing Old Faithful. Yeah. And, that's, and if you go on YouTube and you type in Old Faithful, you get this very old 1930s uh, clip and this cowboy is singing to his dying horse. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's old faithful, you know, and uh, what it's going to do. And the horse recovers at the end of the clip. Um, but it's all good. And the thing is, as well, it's one more thing. It's country and western music. I mean, I love it, really. I, mean, I, yeah. uh, I don't buy it, but I like to listen to it. Uh, it's so sentimental. And the trollermen, despite their tough image, they've got soft hearts, really. They really are uh, softies underneath. And um, again, it's this Johnny Cash image. You know, I'm a tough guy. You know, nobody mess with me. But I love my mother. Do you mean? Yeah. Uh, so there's so this very sentimental, sloppy side uh, beneath that tough exterior. You see. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, it certainly does, yeah. yeah. It certainly does. And yeah, I, I've in, occasionally lived and worked down Hazel Road. There's still a strong 
yeah. sense of country and western. And you go to the clubs and the pubs and it's all and there. Yeah, it's wonderful, you know. Singer so. Every Saturday night or whenever. Yeah, and Dickie Taylor on, on uh, the Fishing Founders DVD, he talks about the fights. And he said, oh, the fights, you know, nothing really. It's just normal, he said, you know. And, but it's all over and it's forgotten, you know, yeah. sort of thing. And, uh, well, it went sobered up, maybe. Yes. I don't know. But so, it, uh, I, I do try to go against, I don't try to reinforce the the image of the drunken, brawling fisherman yeah. and the screaming fishwife. I hate that, you know, because the Hesleroders are no, nothing like that. But that's the outsider's uh, stereotype, you know, yeah. against them. Again, that comes out of the recollections in the books and from the DVDs is... Yeah, they they played hard, but they you know it wasn't that every bar was like something in a western way no, where people throw through the wieners in the saloon <laughs> bar. It oh, was, sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry, just yeah, they did play hard, and and so I, and one of the things I used to conclude my talks with, uh, I used to Hesler Road in its heyday talk, slide talk yeah. in the old slide days, and I used to say the reason the Hesler Road is have such a zest for life is because they lived so close to death, mm. and I think that's the yeah. That's the reason, right? You're going to get the most out of life if you never know when it's going to end. Mm. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I've been moved to Hull in sort of the mid-'80s and seen, in, to some degree, the social history of Hull really... Fo and the social historians in Hull uh, really focusing on Hesel Road as uh, the most important bit of social history. Later on, there became a kind of sense that Hesel Road and its traditions and its uh, community had kind of monopolised social history in Hull. And there became a little bit of a backlash, to be honest, about the idea of Hesel Road nostalgia. Is that kind of monopoly or that pride of place that Hesel Road has had in Hull social history, is it actually justified to be the most talked about, the most written about and the most filmed part of Hull's history? Um, is it justified? Well, I suppose not, in, a fair, fair, in an ideal fair world, you know. But, I mean, I suppose, obviously, I've got to put my hand up and plead guilty. Yeah, I was say, I mean, a lot of these, when I talk about <laughs> books, DVDs, not all of them, but a significant part of them yeah. uh, has been thanks, thanks to you, as well, and, and has been thanks to you as well. Well, I've been doing it 40 years, yeah. as we've already established, you know. And, and I remember when I first started back in 1974, I thought, oh, goodness, you know, somebody must have done all this work before. And so I checked with the, with the library, and I went to the museums, and there was nothing. And I, and I thought, you see, maybe because I'm small myself and uh, have deformity and all that shit, I'm always on the side of the underdog, you see. Yeah. Uh, and then also this thing about the bulldozers moving in and, and the attitude amongst the, I blame the officers, who most of them were not from Hull originally. Uh, a lot of the councillors are, and they're sympathetic. But, um, and so I thought, well, balls to this, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> you know, nothing's been done. <clears throat> I'm going to do a photographic study. Nobody's paying me to do it. It's coming, yeah. I suppose, from my heart. Well, it is. And um, and I want to keep going all this time, would I? Uh, if I didn't strike some code, so I felt the sympathy for the underdog, yeah. if I can call Hesler Rhodes underdogs, uh, that they were disparaged. I mean, they had to fight against uh, nature, as we've already outlined. They had to fight against the trawler barons, who really, really exploited them, mm. as for all the all they were worth. <clears throat> and then they had to fight against social snobbery within Hull itself. So, given this situation, I decided to write about them and to try and put this injustice right. Yeah. Alec Gill, thank you very much for joining us on The Reading Room. My pleasure. Thank you, Dan. <laughs>